Okay. Uh, okay. All right. Thank you all very much for coming out this evening. More people coming in. Uh, my name is Joshua Tucker. I'm the I'm a professor of politics here at NYU and also the director for the Jordan Center for the Advanced Study of Russia. Um, before I begin today, I want to quickly say, before I get all, we get into the event and the speakers, I just want to quickly welcome all of you on behalf of, my, on behalf of myself at the Jordan Center for the Advanced Study of Russia, as well as Alex Cooley, Professor Alex Cooley um, and of the Harriman Institute at Columbia. Alex is running a little late. There was a babysitter uh, mishap, but Alex will be joining us later on in the event. This is part of what we have called, we are calling now, and have been calling the last couple of years, our New York City Russia Public Policy Series. It's a series that's jointly sponsored by Columbia and NYU, by the Harriman Institute and the Jordan Center, and it's generously funded uh, by the Carnegie Corporation of New York. So we want to thank Carnegie as well very much for this. I'd also like to hugely thank uh, Sasha Spitalnik, our new uh, program administrator, I guess she's not that new anymore, <laughs> program administrator at the Jordan Center, without whom none of this would have happened. Um, it takes a lot of work to get everything together and get everybody here. Uh, we, I would like to, uh, I'm thrilled to have all of you here, and would like to encourage you, those of you who are interested, to keep an eye on, if you haven't already signed up for the Jordan Center mailing list, to please afterwards go to the Jordan Center website, get on our mailing list, so you can get notifications of all of our events, as well as you'll get all of the publications on our All the Russias blog, uh, which goes out. Um, and But you'll find out about more of these events uh, in the future. Uh, so with that said, I'd like to move on to tonight's event. Um, and it is my great pleasure to be joined on the stage by these four scholars. I'm going to introduce each of them in turn as they go to speak. Oh, there's Alex. <laughs> OK. Alex Cooley, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> So, um, so uh, I won't have to, you could, Alex, Alex will close the evening, so we'll give him a chance to think of words that he wants to say at that point. Um, so our plan tonight was, uh, when we planned this event, was to time this perfectly uh, with the impeachment trial. And I have to say, I was in Washington, D.C. yesterday uh, in the Capitol, and uh, it was even, I managed to get into the House Gallery while the, while the impeachment trial started in the Senate, but didn't quite make it into the Senate Gallery. But I can confirm that Washington is a buzz about what is going on, uh, what is going on with the impeachment trial. But of course, the impeachment trial isn't happening in a vacuum, and the impeachment trial has a, a major other international player that, that, that is involved in it. So our idea here for tonight's event was, while the impeachment trial was going on, and I will say everything came according to our plans. The trial started exactly when we wanted it to for the uh, purpose of this event. While the trial was going on, to take a moment and pause and think about the effect that impeachment is having on Ukraine, has had on Ukraine, and could potentially have on Ukraine, and not just on Ukraine, but on Russia, Ukraine's relations with Russia, Russia's relations with the United States, Ukraine's relations with the United States. So we are extremely, extremely pleased um, that we are joined by this illustrious group of, of scholars. Um, we've asked them each to speak for about 10 minutes as an opening statement, and if you ask an academic to speak for about 10 minutes, it means they'll speak for about 15 to 20 minutes, but we'll try to keep it to 15 minutes but which should give us plenty of time to get to questions. Um, and the plan for the evening is that we'll have each of the speakers give their opening statement. We'll introduce them in turn as they're speaking. Uh, then Alex and I will ask a few questions at that point, and then we'll throw it out to the audience. And we have the room until uh, 7 o'clock tonight. So I'm going to, without further ado, I'd like to begin um, with Dr. Olga Uth, who is a associate professor of politics at the University of Manchester. She joined the University of Manchester in 2014 after holding previous research posts at Toronto. Oxford and Harvard University. Her 2014 book, Mapping Mass Mobilizations, explores the processes leading up to mass protest engagement in Ukraine and Argentina. Onik is now the principal investigator of the ORA funded project Mobilize, which studies the micro foundations of protest and migration in seven countries Ukraine, Poland, Argentina, Morocco, the UK, Spain, and Germany. Um, and I can say personally, she's doing an amazing job also, not just doing this comparative analysis across these countries, but mobilizing the, scholar, mobilizing the scholarly <laughs> community who's interested in, pro, in protest. And she has been a real sort of tour de force in getting other scholars, who are, getting scholars who are studying different countries talking to each other about that. Um, she's also the principal investigator of the project Identity and Borders in Flux, 
which studies the role of ethno-national identities in determining political behavior and policy preferences. And her research on protest politics in Ukraine is, has resulted in her consulting policymakers in Canada, Ukraine, the UK, and US. So, Olga's gonna kick us off tonight. Dr. Olga. Thank you. All right. I'm just going to pull up my 30-minute slide. <laughs> come today and so on and so forth. Impeachment, the view from Ukraine. So Washington may be a buzz, but I hate to break it to you all. <laughs> to be honest, the Ukrainians are actually not talking much about the impeachment. Now here's an exchange that's been uh, uh, from my <coughs> colleagues who are journalists based in Kiev, a foreign journalist based in Kiev, an Ukrainian journalist based in Kiev. What e impeachment coverage? Ukrainian journalists don't seem interested, or perhaps readers aren't. Ukrainian journalists and Ukrainians don't really understand our impeachment process and the significance. The process is complicated. I'm sure a lot of Americans would agree. Um, and they, the Ukrainian journalist sums up with there's a li limited audience for that. I asked them what they wanted me to convey to you here today, last night. This is what they wanted to convey to you. And the thing is, to understand the Ukrainian perspective on the current impeachment trial, you must understand ordinary Ukrainians and what they have lived through, the context they have lived through over the past six years. And this is where the foreign journalists made that very important point. There's a lot of other very important things happening in Ukraine, uh, to be fair. War, corruption, reforms, etc. So the data that I'm presenting to you today is from two projects that I was Leading. One was in 2014 with Henry Hale at GW and Tim Colton at, at Harvard and, and Nadia Kravitz. We did a three-way panel survey in 2014, right as everything started to kick off. And then uh, from our mobilized project, we were surveys that we conducted twice in Ukraine in 2019, including directly before the infamous phone call. Okay? So the last six years in Ukraine have been really tumultuous. It started off with a mass protest bringing down the president in 2014. Uh, shortly thereafter, there began the war with Russia uh, following the annexation of Crimea and little green men started to pop up in the Donbass. Poroshenko wins the elections as this conflict is unfolding. Of course, this was an incredible win. He was a compromise candidate, right? He was supposed to unify the country and he won in the first round, which was quite rare at that point. Uh, in Ukraine. Actually, it only happened um, once before. And uh, there was a mass internal displacement because of the conflict, but also there has been a mass out-migration out as of 2014, going into various parts of Europe and beyond. But throughout all of this tumultuous period in Ukraine, including a severe economic crisis, the Ukraine has been, uh, the UK, uh, I can't even say it, Right? The US has been an important partner throughout. Some would say until Trump, some would say until now, some would say until 2019, but after five years of war, this is certainly in question, right? Enter the context of 2019 to understand why Ukrainians are not maybe thinking about this all the time. Those who want to leave the country has risen by 18 percentage points since 2014 to 2019. 34% of the population wants to leave. Now where do they want to leave? Do they want to leave to the US? I'm sure a lot of policymakers might be worried about that, but no. Here's a hint. 9% have friends and family in the US. 31% have friends and family living or working in Russia. So where do you think they want to go? Poland. Poland. <laughs> Somebody said it. Like with diplomacy, moving away from the US and certainly away from Russia, the center of gravity is moving to Germany. Okay? So whoever said that was right. If I had a candy of this with a lecture, you'd get it. Uh, yeah, Germany. 20, nearly 26% of the Ukrainian population wants to go to Germany, then Poland, then the Czech Republic, and only then the US. Uh, 
but also, this is, this is important, right? They're not, so even though Ukrainians, 73% according to Q, just recently, percent of Ukrainians see the US positively, this is not a place where they want to end up living, even though they live in a country to, uh, that is uh, torn by war and economic crisis and so on. Okay. Of course, the big issues in Ukraine are war. I'm not going to show you stats about that. But the big other one is corruption. 74% <coughs> of Ukrainians think that state agencies are corrupt to a large extent. That, that's incredibly uh, important. And second of all, thir third of all, sorry, it's poverty. Okay? Few people talk about the aspects of poverty in Ukraine. Few people talk about that in the last five, six years, and at least, uh, uh, Julia, I always say your name incorrectly, yeah. but <laughs> has written about this too. Family financial situations have declined over the last six years substantially. And in our data from 2019, 57% <coughs> of the people we polled, 57% of the Ukrainian population feel their family financial situation has declined, okay? Deteriorated, not even staying the same, deteriorated. And this is the context in which Zelensky wins a massive landslide and 23%. And this is the context in which his party then, in July of 2019, also wins a massive slam landslide. We have not seen a win in the Ukrainian Rada, the parliament, of the nature which we saw in July. Okay? And it seemed that he and his party members were the only ones who seemed to understand Ukrainians that it was corruption and poverty and all these other things, and the center of gravity, where it was moving to. It seems a lot of people also missed it. And it certainly wasn't only other Ukrainians running against him. It seems also the man on the other end of the telephone call also misunderstood and miscalculated the situation. Trump and his proxies, Trump and his advisors, thought that Zelensky needs war supplies and tackled corruption, right? If we just look at the data, that would seem about right. But seems to, they seem to have forgotten that Ukraine has more partners, that Ukraine has substantial partners in, in Germany, in UK, and in Canada that have also supported the Ukrainian military over this time. And while it was not new, and this is according to insiders within the administration who spoke to me under Chatham House rules, and while it was not new for them to uh, have financial support be levied against some kind of benefit. What was new to them was that this was going to be military aid at a time of conflict for what was clearly and evidently personal benefit. And of course, people not willing to speak publicly about this, uh, even though uh, several members of the administration have made complaints officially. This was clearly sending the wrong signal in what was already a low trust environment in 2019. And so, here, I think, is the main element. And like many of Zelensky's opponents, who seem to keep missing this, and I don't know why, but Trump and his proxies, Trump and his advisors, seem to be thinking they were dealing with a naive, inexperienced head of state, and they were misguided, and this was a massive miscalculation, right? He may be smarter than he looks, OK? Or he has better advisors than we thought. But either way, and this is again from conversations under Chatham House rules, they seem to have understood that fighting corruption by enabling corruption won't work. That's what that would have been, right? And specifically, uh, insiders have told me that they were worried that this relentless opposition that they keep facing, were they to find out about this occurring, mm -hmm. they would react to it quite strongly and publicly. Also, they told me if Trump wasn't reelected, there's a, there's a huge, and this is possible, there's a huge risk of a Democrat backlash in the aftermath. Um, and they were also aware that maybe not to the same extent, maybe not in the same way, but Ukraine can get support elsewhere and has been. Um, and to them, perhaps the calculus was a little bit clearer than expected, yeah? And so the impeachment <coughs> trial that is happening right now is the cost of a massive miscalculation on the US side. And here we are today, right? The interesting thing is that there are two groups that come out looking quite bad here, and it's not Zelensky's camp, okay? 
Uh, the group that clearly comes out bad, and according to Ukrainian and foreign journalists both agreed on this, it was the old guard, right? Um, indeed, the old guard looks so bad they don't want to even touch this, so Poroshenko, etc., are afraid to touch it, um, <coughs> while the new guard think they're unfairly involved by Lutsenko in this, right? Uh, Poroshenko looks so bad they stopped to answer questions about this. Poroshenko was about to give us an interview but withdrawal as soon as there was mention of speaking about the U.S. Um, yeah, and then uh, if we <coughs> journalists say in advance we want to talk about Trump, the interviews get canceled. So this is a screen grab uh, that uh, Natalia Gumenyuk from Hormatsky TV wanted me to send to you, to show to you today. Mm. So. What is interesting, and those who may be opponents of the left <coughs> might not be buying into this, but the general population in Ukraine actually does. It, his party and television show, Servant of the People, um, he is still seen as the servant of the people. He is still seen as being well connected to the general population in a house of cards, right? Here the US uh, president, the US political establishment is seen as the equivalent of another popular Netflix show the House of Cards. And this is not an advertisement for the online streamer uh, service, but this is how it's portrayed, when it is portrayed, yeah? The optics in Ukraine, too many focus on Zelensky's relentless opposition, not enough focus on the high level of popularity, 73 to 66 percent um, in the recent polls, okay? Plus, Zelensky's ability to get political elite on board in Ukraine, even his opponents through various backdoor channels. Plus, the fact that it's Poroshenko and Co. that looks bad in this context, and not so much the current Zelensky administration. This is important popular optics among ordinary Ukrainians, right? Zelensky's popularity is juxtaposed with Trump's declining uh, ratings. Trump is seen as the corrupt one, and Zelensky, right or wrong, is seen as the one who did not succumb to his attempts. I don't know, but if you are <laughs> playing to the Ukrainian audience, you're kind of winning right now. So the view from Ukraine. The Ukrainian leadership have come out looking far better than expected. I don't think most people would have expected this when we first heard the news. And in the process, they have strengthened their relationships with other partners, including Germany, UK, and Canada specifically. Uh, the US is no longer seen as a fully trustworthy partner in securing peace. And this is important because what was being discussed with military aid and Ukraine relying on the US to help defend itself against an existential threat from Russia. In a low trust environment, this is bigger than impeachment proceedings, no matter how interesting they may be in DC. And the possible fallout is actually more global than local. Um, I would like more conversations to be had about that, but I think that's one key missed today in, in Washington. So that's just my opinion. Thank you. Great. Okay, our second speaker tonight will be, our second member of the panel, is Dr. Jordan Gans Morse, who is an associate professor at Northwestern University in the Department of Politics. His ongoing research, picking up on the themes uh, that Olga's just been talking about here, focuses on corruption, <laughs> rule of law, property rights, and political and economic transitions. He's the author of Property Rights in Post-Soviet Russia, Violence, Corruption, and the Demand for Law at Cambridge University Press, and currently at work on a new book manuscript tentatively titled To Steal or to Serve, Motivations for Public Service in Corrupt States. Drawing on evidence from Russia, Ukraine, and Georgia, the study examines the roots of systemic corruption and investigates strategies for curtailing the predatory states that plague citizens throughout the much of the world. Prior to his doctoral studies, Gans Morris was a junior fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in Washington, D.C., a recipient of two U.S. State Department fellowships to Moscow, and a resident director for the American Council for International Education Student Exchange Program in St. Petersburg, Russia. So please welcome Dr. George Gans Morris. Thanks so much to you and to Alex uh, for the chance to be here. Um, 
this is going to pick up actually right where the first presentation left off, so this is fantastic. Um, along with Timothy Frick, the Kiev School of Economics, he's also a full writer here at NYU, <coughs> and present right here, and Aaron uh, Ehrlich from McGill. We're going to talk about a, a, a survey that we did just last week, um, specifically on this question of how Ukrainians are thinking about impeachment. Uh, this is through a gratis panel that is a mobile phone survey, and so I should say up front uh, that it's representative of the online population. So we're talking about people who skew a little bit younger, under 60, adult population under 60. Uh, we're talking about people who are in cities of uh, 50,000 or more. So it's, it's not representative of all of Ukraine, but it is a broad swath of Ukraine. We had about 700, a little under 750 people participate in this, and as you'll see, the first thing we want to have was just some sense of to what degree are people even aware at all about the impeachment process, and 89% have heard of it, at least. Obviously, varies in ways you'd expect, 97% in Kiev. Um, for the purpose of everything else we're going to talk about, we're going to take out uh, the 11% that have not heard about it and really focus on some details. So one of the first things that came to my mind uh, when the July 25th call between Zelensky and Trump occurred, uh, and I think probably to many people in this room and many people have written talk about this, which is irony of Trump asking Zelensky to do something that's so typical for the post-communist world in terms of some sort of politicized judicial investigation for specifically a president, as we've been discussing, who has based his whole reputation so far on fighting this type of thing. And so one of the possible things we would want to be concerned about would be to what extent do people, rightly or wrongly, in Ukraine somehow perceive this as, as hurting this image of Zelensky as an anti-corruption reformer? And the answer, right in line with everything we've talked about so far, is not a whole lot. So what we're looking at here is the red, or is no change in opinion. Uh, blue means that you're more likely to think that um, Zelensky, you're, you're more, more thinking that Zelensky is a, a corruption fighter. And uh, black is that you're less likely to think that Zelensky is a corruption fighter. And we have here the higher <coughs> group that was surveyed versus Zelensky supporters, meaning people who voted in the second round in April uh, for Zelensky versus Poroshenko uh, supporters. And again, the main thing here is not a lot to worry about uh, in terms of at least how average people are thinking about this, this issue. Uh, not surprisingly, perhaps, but among mm. Poroshenko supporters, more people did have their view say this is hurting the views of Zelensky as a, as a corruption reformer. <laughs> the other question that was maybe just broadly from asking about corruption, how is this affecting support for Zelensky in something like a future election? And again, the main takeaway is not a whole lot, um, but again, Poroshenko voters who are, and this again is not, are you inclined to vote for Zelensky? This, did this event, did impeachment, this whole process that you're hearing about potentially affect your willingness? Or did it get worse for uh, Poroshenko supporters? Yeah, more of them. Um, but overall, I think the major takeaway again is that this, for lots of reasons, is not really the primary thing on an average person in Ukraine's mind. The second thing that we're concerned about is what are the impacts of international affairs? Uh, not just specifically how Ukrainians might think about uh, Zelensky, but how is this affecting the relationship between the United States and Ukraine? How is this affecting uh, negotiations between Ukraine and Russia, specifically now that there's a sense that the US doesn't have Ukraine's back in the way that it has in the past? And here, what we're talking about is on the left, the, the black is that it's harming whatever the question is, so it's making Ukraine, US, uh, Ukrainian relations worse. The red is having no effect. The blue is that it's helping relations. And the green is saying it's hard to say. And here, there's definitely some sense that impeachment is causing harm. Um, it's worse among the Poroshenko supporters. Um, perhaps not surprising, but certainly something that fits with what you might expect in terms of people wondering to what extent Trump and the administration supports Ukraine. But interestingly, there was less of an effect with a very specific issue, which is how is the impeachment process affecting negotiations between Russia and Ukraine over the conflict in the eastern part of the country? And here, again, more people overall say, yeah, it's, it's, the impeachment is bad for these. Uh, it's certainly not good. But it's having less of an effect, in their opinion, than the overall effect on US-Ukrainian relations. And the final thing that we took a look at was this broader question of what is the global impact in terms of how is the US image of the United States changing due to Trump's actions with respect to the Ukraine scandal in Ukraine and the impeachment. Um, obviously, we're looking just at Ukraine, so 
it's a much broader question. Perhaps the image of the United States is harmed more in other countries, but we're specifically interested in what the Ukrainians thought. So we asked them, the US often holds itself up as a model of the rule of law. How has the impeachment process changed your views, if at all? Mm -hmm. And which I think is good news for the United States is that despite everything going on uh, with Trump, the main thing is that mostly things are unchanged. Uh, one thing that did pop up, but I think there's various ways to think about this, is that a sizable number of Poroshenko supporters say that the impeachment process has actually improved mm -hmm. their view of the United States as a rule of law country. <coughs> um, obviously, the majority still say that there was no change, but, but a not, not my a not group here saw improvement. We can speculate on this, we'd have to do more research to understand, but I, I think part of this may be some sense that at least somebody's being held within strength. Like the fact that, that, that there are constraints, there are checks and balances, the fact that something's being done, whereas perhaps in Ukraine, if you're an average Ukraine, you'd say, if you did this, nothing would be done. Um, maybe that's partly what's behind this, but that was perhaps a little bit interesting, but more from the broader perspective of, you know, for, for me as someone who's interested in the rule of law, and I look at Trump, I'm quite concerned about the world view of us right now. At least for Ukrainians, this put me a little bit at ease that Ukrainians haven't lost the entire faith in our, in our country. The final thing I'll say a few words about was, comes out of uh, just an experience I had. I was in Ukraine in December uh, for an event about uh, rule of law and transparency, and we were talking to a lot of uh, prosecutors and judges and, and lawyers. So not necessarily typical Ukrainians, but very well educated, very knowledgeable, uh, who are following the process quite closely because this impeachment is interesting to them. Uh, but the amount of false fake news, and I hate to use the term, but I mean, literally Fox-based stories um, that have been the type of thing that are debunked repeatedly in the, in the impeachment process by Russia experts, by Ukraine experts, by experts from the State Department, were things that these judges were asking. So is it true that this, is, and I'll say some, comment, you know, some examples in a moment, is this true? Is that true? And so we were wondering, um, Aaron and Timothy and I were wondering to what degree are there beliefs in, in things that are not true versus true with respect to the, uh, to the impeachment scandal. So for example, we asked, to what degree is it true that the impeachment process started with a phone conversation between Trump and Zelensky? Here we've got uh, the black means people leaning towards it's not true, the red leaning towards it's true, and the blue leaning towards it's hard to say. And more people think it's true than not true, but, but a reasonable number also thought it was not true. Um, now again, of course, we already saw that many people heard of the impeachment process, and, and we're certainly from the average Ukrainian perspective, with all the things that are happening in Ukraine, I don't think it's particularly shocking that people didn't necessarily pay a lot of attention to a specific phone call. Um, but certainly, it, they lean towards understanding this correct, but there's not a lot of, uh, but there are a significant number of people who did not realize that. Then we asked one of the classic questions that's floating around in the uh, blog sphere, and so I don't the right word anymore, social media sphere, or whatever it is that, that we want to call it. Uh, Hillary Clinton hid secret emails on a server that is now in Baltimore, Ukraine. And either because of specific knowledge or just from a general understanding, this sounds kind of absurd. Most people think, no, that's not true. Um, I won't put it up here because it was too obvious, but we also asked the question is, is it true that it was Ukraine, not Russia, that intervened in the 2016 US presidential elections? And Ukrainians, again, I don't know if it reflects actual knowledge or just like, no way, that can't be. But that clearly was one that everybody said that has to be false. Just a couple more. A true statement, President Donald Trump delayed military aid to Ukraine to encourage Zelensky to investigate Joe Biden, mm -hmm. one of Trump's political opponents. Very much the case that people knew that was true. And then a couple that were harder, and I think partly we need to think if we're gonna do more of this about how to phrase this correctly, but we gave a statement that technically is not true. True, Hunter Biden, son of the US presidential candidate Joe Biden, engaged in corruption while serving on the board of, of directors for the Ukrainian company Burisma, Many people thought this was true. Um, I think there's a number of ways you could include this. It is true that Burisma is involved in corruption and being investigated for that. And so I think in terms of phrasing it, it's possible that that's what we're picking up. It also could just be general and reasonable cynicism that big business, corrupt, yeah, probably true. Um, but the part about Hunter Biden certainly is something that's getting as much press as real stories in the United States. Um, and so the fact that that gets picked up on was somewhat interesting. And the final one, is a little bit more complicated, but we ask this question that's also being pushed by uh, supporters of, of President Trump, um, that the idea that President Donald Trump pressuring Zelensky to open specific investigations is just normal policy for US politicians. Biden acted similarly as Vice President when he encouraged the Poroshenko administration to file General Prosecutor Shulkin. And again, people say, yeah, that sounds about right. Um, which I think is probably, again, picking up just a general level of cynicism in terms of 
that's how politics works. Um, certainly how it works in Ukraine, probably how it works in the United States, uh, so we'll agree with that. The main takeaways, I think, are overall that the impact on a, at least a public opinion level here uh, is relatively minimal. I mean, to the extent that there is an, imp an impact on either domestic politics, international affairs, and U.S. reputation in Ukraine, it's certainly negative. This is not making the U.S. look good. This is not helping Zelensky, I don't think. Uh, although it is interesting, that I mean, maybe some ways he's, the fact that he stood up to a bully in some perspectives or something like that maybe helped him. But overall, I think this is probably negative, but not a huge impact when you still work. To the extent there is impact, it's bigger among Poroshenko supporters. Overall, the Ukrainians seem to, on this topic, impeachment, distinguish fairly well between truths and falsehoods, with an understandably general, simple view about business and politics. And then, of course, I'll end with a caveat, which is just, even if there's not a lot of an effect specifically through the, the, the means of the mechanism of public opinion, I think it's important to keep in mind all the other ways that Ukraine's being affected by this, whether it's Zelensky um, or the U.S. image uh, and reputation worldwide being affected, which could be, for example, making Ukrainian activists be fighting corruption dismay. I mean, I, I mean, this is certainly something I came across talking to anti-corruption activists in December and lawyers who, who were saying you know, that they know the United States is not the perfect thing that they maybe once thought it was, but they still kind of hope that there is something out there to aspire to, and, and losing that aspirational model matters. Um, not to the average person, but to activists. I think that's quite damaging. And likewise, certainly, all of this has an effect in terms of how Russia thinks about strategy with regard to the United States and the US. So there's lots of ways it can matter, but if we're asking the basic question about how do Ukrainians, more or less typical Ukrainians, think about this, I think the effects are pretty muted. So I'll leave it at that, and uh, thanks so much again for the chance to be here tonight. I hope you guys caught the fact that that's in the small print. That survey was in the field last week. Mm -hmm. So these results that he's giving us are things from like literally a week old on public opinion. Okay, our third uh, speaker today is Dr. Arsana Shevel, who's an associate professor at Tufts University in the Department of Political Science. Uh, professor Shevel's research and teaching focus on the post-communist regime surrounding Russia and issues such as nation and state building the politics of citizenship and migration, <coughs> memory and religious politics, and challenges to democratization in the post-Soviet region. She's the author of Migration, Refugee Policy, and State Building in Post-Communist Europe, which was published by Cambridge University Press in 2011, which examines how the politics of national identity and strategies of the United Nations High Council on Refugees shape refugee admission policies in the post-communist region. And the book won the American Association of Ukrainian Studies 2012 Book Award. Shevel is president of the now president of the American Association for Ukrainian Studies, mm -hmm. vice president of the Association for the Study of Nationalities, and a country expert on Ukraine for Global Citizenship Obser Observatory. Um, outside of academia, Shevel has served as a consultant for the UN High Commissioner for Refugees and for the US Department of State, and has provided expert testimony on applications for asylum in US courts. So please join me in welcoming Professor Shevel. <laughs> Um, people wanting the end of corruption, 
uh, improvement of you know, living standards and things like that, and also on the end uh, to this conflict in Ukraine uh, that has been going on uh, since 2014. So what can we sort of, you know, so I'm gonna talk about those and try to um, talk about some possible implications that the impeachment um, situation may have uh, for the Zelensky agenda. Right? Now, so to start, to start with the corruption issue, um, I think, uh, and I'm not the only one or the first one to say that, but I think the corruption success for Ukraine has really implications that are not just affecting Ukraine and the future of Zelensky presidency, but I think it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that if, it, if Zelensky indeed succeeds and Ukraine um, would um, make some dramatic progress in fighting corruption, I think it would have broader implications for the post-Soviet region, generally speaking, and for the fate kind of, of democracy even though that sounds very lofty, uh, you know, term or goal, but I think there is some, some truth to that. Why would I say that? Because if we look at the, um, the trajectory of the post Soviet countries since 1991, um, really um, this um, trade-off between stability um, and economic success and political competitiveness has been quite evident in many countries. In other words, um, the periods that were associated with greater competitiveness, you know, to think of Russia, for example, right? The Yeltsin period when there was more freedom of the press, Right, um, more general political competitiveness was also associated with severe economic, socioeconomic dislocation, all sorts of socioeconomic problems. And then Putin, when he comes to power and essentially political freedoms begin to roll back, builds his legitimization narrative on this argument that you cannot really have both in this part of the world. Right, like so that's kind of the um, that you may have to sacrifice some freedoms, political freedoms, this kind of instabi inst instability that democracy uh, and competitive political process produce, but in return you get the social stability, um, right, and improved in living standards, and that's basically kind of why managed democracy is better, right, and that's why popular protests are better, you can sort of have all these implications, why colored revolutions are better for those, right. So in Ukraine, right, um, the presidents, whenever they try to um, institute sort of similar kind of um, strengthening authoritarianism with this argument, it did not go nearly as successful as in Russia. We can talk about reasons why that is the case, not least because the country has historically been divided and there was always much stronger base for opposition, whoever was in opposition in Russia, I mean in Ukraine than in Russia. But the point that I'm trying to say here that if Zelensky does succeed and we basically have Ukraine, which has very competitive political environment, right, but which does have free and fair elections, Right, which also may succeed in rooting out corruption, in increasing economic standards, sort of making people want to stay in the country instead of leave, right? Kind of, so these two benefits would accrue together, right? That would really be a great example and potentially, you know, really detrimental to this managed democracy model, right? Uh, that we see um, have been established in Russia. You can think of sort of different versions of it in Central Asia, that the country is not ready for democracy, or the culture is not right, right? All of these things. So in other words, um, so I think Zelensky's success really has at stake more than just you know, success for the future of Ukraine um, in that regard. Now, um, given the, the, the polling results that were just presented, that there is still belief in Ukraine that actually the rule of law in the US um, still present, this is actually quite encouraging because I was thinking one of the main kind of negative implications of this uh, impeachment um, situation and process here would be exactly that you know, people who advocate and countries that advocate for transparency, <coughs> for accountability, they're no better. Right? And that has long been the narrative uh, of autocratic leaders in the post-Soviet region, including Putin, who would say that opposition is equally corrupt, right? They, they just want to steal, just like, yes, maybe we stole something and we did something bad, but they're really no better than us. So there is really no point in changing uh, you know, one for the other, kind of like stick with what you have, right? So the fact that Ukrainians actually apparently have not lost face in the, um, a rule of law in this country, I mean, that's, um, I would say that's encouraging. But again, if you think about it, right, the argument that you have to kind of uh, follow the advice, um, the official advice and not be corrupt and so forth is, you know, much harder to take seriously and easier to take skeptically given what we know what has transpired um, with the pressure uh, on open Buddhism investigation and all of all this. Right. So, so as far as like just you know, since time is short, I just want to mention another thing about the reforms. I mean, I obviously don't have time um, to go over different reforms Zelensky government has instituted. But the, the I mean, the thing to watch about it's not really that easy sometimes to say if particular reform measure is actually the right one, right? It would produce the consequences that it does, that we want it to produce, right? Because oftentimes these measures sort of we can say um, like um, the the stick with two ends. I'll give you some examples, right? Like say the uh, elimination of the immunity for the members of parliament. So on the one hand, right, it seems like a very positive reform measure. 
you know that with that uh, you know um, there has been a lot of corrupt politicians in, in the legislature, right? And they, they can enjoy immunity and they can commit crimes like that's not right. On the other hand, we also know that historically in Ukraine and not only in Ukraine, oftentimes the legislature is really the base for opposition to authoritarian executives, right? So the MPs having immunity um, for members of the legislation also protect their political immunity, right? And their ability to criticize the executive without being brought in on what could be phony charges of corruption or criminal misdeeds and so forth, right? And again, in that part of the world we're talking about, that has happened. So, and then again, you can think, I mean, just by, by, by sort of another example, say increase of the prosecutorial power, that was another one of the reforms in Ukraine that was instituted to fight corruption, and now Prosecutor General who Zelensky described in his um, phone conversation with Trump as 100% to the man. I'm not saying he's a bad prosecutor. I mean, for all accounts, he seems to be you know, genuinely interested in fighting corruption. But again, increasing this sort of personal power right, in this kind of political environment with this political history could also have negative consequences. So um, the, um, I think the pathway um, sort of where the reforms would lead, it's really something fascinating to study, you know, but it's also useful to keep in mind how any specific reform goal would produce both positive and potentially negative externalities. And there is really no answer to that, but we can certainly address more some specific um, um, specifics of these um, in the Q&A. There's not even no time to go over that specifics of the reforms. Now, uh, let me say just a few words um, on, the, on the Donbass issue, right? Um, again, when Zelensky got elected, this, um, the, the, the policy of bringing peace and, uh, and putting an end to conflict really has support across the board in Ukraine. Now, that is not to say that Ukrainians are willing to compromise um, anything, right? And sort of when we talk about the specifics, as you probably all know, there have been two peace agreements signed, the Minsk 1 and Minsk 2. They remain um, in large part unimplemented. Um, again, for reasons we don't have time to go into right now, we certainly can address them um, in the, uh, later on, right? Um, but the, um, so he, his uh, you know, promise of bringing peace is very important. And um, Ukrainians generally share the view that some compromise is necessary, although what specific compromise is necessary is um, much more thorny a question. And again, there is variety of opinions. If you ask, like, would you agree to say federalization, right, certain specific rights to these regions, right, what, what elections under what rules, and so forth, right? Um, but I think it is quite encouraging that Zelensky is really, um, I mean, at least, again, maybe not everybody in the audience would agree, but to me, he seems to have been able so far to achieve some success, um, as in it, it was the release um, of prisoners, um, the exchange of prisoners, the ceasefire, right? And at the same time, he hasn't really crossed any of what many in Ukraine um, consider as uh, such as federalizing the country or you know, a, a, a allowing, agreeing to the elections on Russian terms. And basically, he openly acknowledged that he, Putin do not see eye to eye, right? So this, um, so if we try to bring the impeachment in here, I think uh, obviously US military aid um, being withheld, um, there is some debate what specific aid um, that Ukraine receives is really uh, critically important uh, for um, in the process of uh, this conflict, right, as far as deterring further potential aggression, right. Um, again, this is a, a complicated uh, issue, but the, the, the role that US could have played and should have played in um, kind of acting in some, to some extent as a mediator, I would say perhaps is more problematic now, right? Given what has transpired, even though US is not even technically part of this Minsk peace process, and yet, right, uh, given the loss of the expertise on Russia and the region that we have seen um, people leaving the administration, right, kind of disarray, we can say many disillusionment among uh, high ranking Korea diplomats. I mean, I don't think any of that uh, bodes well for the kind of role uh, US could play in support um, of um, Zelensky's efforts and kind of mediate. Um, would be, to my estimation, quite negative, right? Again, because this narrative that you have to fight the corruption, like <coughs> we now see that the um, kind of dealings that have been going on um, in the administration here, but at the same time, people remain optimistic and that may be the fact that there is actually a transparent process of investigating, interviewing witnesses, get, gathering evidence, exactly the kind of thing that would not really be happening in this part of the world. Um, and then um, on the Donbass conflict, um, I think, uh, again, uh, I imagine not everybody would agree, but I think Zelensky did manage, despite his lack of expertise, to really kind of strike the right balance, right? Like we are not surrendering, we are not giving in too much, but we are open to conversation, right, to, uh, com to some compromise, and we acknowledge the fact that it's not really a frozen conflict. People are dying all the time. I think this is also important to keep in mind. There are Ukrainian soldiers dying. So there is an urgency, right, to do something about it, um, and uh, he has, I'd say, achieved some limited success um, in that regard. 
So I'll end here. Great. Thanks. Um, our final speaker tonight is Dr. Keith Darden. Uh, Dr. Keith Darden is an associate professor at the American University School of International Service. Professor Darden's research focuses on nationalism, state building, and the politics of Russia, Ukraine, and Eurasia. His forthcoming book, Resisting Occupation in Eurasia, at Cambridge University Press, explores the development of durable national loyalties through education and details how they explain over a century of regional patterns in voting, secession, and armed resistance in Ukraine, Eurasia, and the world. His award-winning first book, Economic Liberalism and Its Rivals, also published at Cambridge University Press, explored the formation of international economic institutions among the post-Soviet states and explained why countries chose to join the Eurasian Customs Union, the WTO, or to eschew participation in any trade institutions. Professor Dard is also co-editor of the Cambridge University Press book series, Problems of International Politics, and his analyses and interviews concerning events in Ukraine have been published all over the place. I'm not going to read the list of them, but you can find him in many, uh, many, many different publications. Anyway, please join me in welcoming <coughs> Professor Keith Dark. Thank you. Thank you. And you can definitely find him in the Washington Post monkey cage, which is always, always, uh, <laughs> always good reading. And Josh is the editor of that. Um, so I want to take a little bit of a different tack on this question, and I think that. Uh, uh, I want to focus on two questions, really. Uh, one is, you know, the general question of, you know, what does impeachment mean for Ukraine, uh, politically, and particularly for the U.S.-Ukrainian relationship. Uh, but also, on a, from a scholarly front, what have we learned from all of these proceedings? We've actually learned quite a lot. You know, if you, if you care about these countries and you care about, you know, the, the U.S.-Ukrainian relationship, it was kind of interesting viewing for the past. Uh, past several months, and I just want to review, and I think what we've learned has changed, is going to affect the relationship in ways that we probably didn't see even as recently as two weeks ago, so I'm going to sort of conclude with that. My first reaction uh, in the fall, watching the House hearings, uh, I should say I live in Washington, D.C., and you know, most of my neighbors work for the U.S. government, I spend a lot of time with people in Congress, and so you sort of get these things with play dates with your kids, as well as uh, with, with watching the hearings. But the first reaction was that, you know, Ukraine is kind of untouchable, strangely enough, right? If you're a Democrat, right, uh, you painted, you know, Ukraine as a vital U.S. national security interest, right? Something that is absolutely treasonous to turn your back on. That we should be back in Ukraine now and forever, uh, And that Ukraine was essentially a victim in all that you, know, you had a president that was abusing his power, uh, who was essentially twisting the arm of a newly elected president in order to secure political favors for his own election. And that, that is something that you know, Ukraine had no control over. They're a victim in all of this and actually behaved quite virtuously uh, under, under the circumstances. And is worthy of continued support from the United States. If you're a Republican, you also think that Ukraine needs support. Right? For one thing, uh, the relationship is perfect and needs to continue to be perfect in order for a narrative about how the president has damaged a vital security relationship to hold no water in politics. So you don't want Ukraine to fail, because if Ukraine fails, then having temporarily withheld military assistance looks like a catastrophic move, something that has deeply affected U.S. interests. And so the Republicans also kind of want to keep the, keep the ship moving, right? Keep the money flowing. And so it seemed like Ukraine was just going to be fine, right? And that in some ways, you know, the, the sort of narrative about Ukraine that had continued from 2014 with the revolution of dignity, and this was the turn towards the West, you know, the, the victims of Russian aggression, that this was just kind of reinforced in some ways uh, by, what we, by what we saw in the fall. Um, but now I think this is probably wrong. And it's partly because of what we've learned about Ukraine and about the relationship in the course of the hearings, particularly the most recent revelations. In other words, the text messages that Lev Parnas was exchanging with Ukrainian government officials. Right? So what we've seen in the past couple of weeks, and I just recently read the 360 pages of Lev Parnas, you know, WhatsApp text. Um, <laughs> How many of you have read it? Just a show of hands. 
Yeah, not many, right? And they're in Russian, so I actually think most journalists have not read them either, right? So, you know, so the, the, so the more interesting ones are in Russian. You know, we learned from these texts that, you know, the two top law enforcement officials in Ukraine, in the Poroshenko government, were actively conspiring with Lev Parnas and Giuliani and the president to compile uh, compromising material uh, on, on Hunter Biden and Joe Biden for the purposes of, as Lutsenko put it in the text, uh, trashing your political opponent. And this had been initiated in the fall of 2018, so well before anybody imagined Vladimir Zelensky, right? Uh, well before, you know, at a time when people were still holding out the hope that Poroshenko was gonna win that election. <coughs> it was very early on, and so Ukrainian government resources were being devoted to active interference in the U.S. election. Um, that's not good, right? And I think there's going to be a little bit of lag time before people actually know that that's what was in the texts. But it's going to affect things. Um, it's certainly going to affect the Democrats' relationship uh, with Ukraine. Uh, now, granted, this was the previous government. Right? And so that, that, does, that does help. But, you know, Parnas was exchanging daily texts with Lutsenko, but also with, you know, certainly beginning in March, with uh, Arsene Ivanko, who is the current Minister of Internal Affairs of Ukraine. Right? And so the continuity in personnel in those governments and the concerns about uh, what the Ukrainian government was doing, uh, I think that's going to have some kind of an effect. Moreover, the Ukrainian government was conspiring against U.S. diplomats. And U.S. diplomats notice those things. They can read texts, right? Uh, and so this is going to have an effect uh, on the U.S. diplomatic corps' relationship uh, to those officials and to the Ukrainian government, right? The, the, the asks on Lutsenko's side for digging up all of these uh, materials about Burisma and, and uh, the channeling of funds from uh, Lutsenko to uh, Seneca Holdings and things like that, the ask on his end was to have Masha Yovanovitch fired, right? to have our ambassador removed, because she was too critical of, uh, of his anti-corruption efforts, uh, yeah, let's put it that way, uh, very neutrally, uh, and wanted his support from the US government in his struggle against uh, the National Anti-Corruption Bureau of Ukraine. Right? And so this is also just not good. It's not consistent with that early, we're just a victim there. Uh, there is a very real extent to which there was outreach from the Ukrainian side, from the Ukrainian government side, to produce materials that they thought the Trump administration would like to get some things that they wanted from the Trump administration. Uh, so I think that as that narrative comes out, um, and I think it's gonna, we're sort of at the beginning of that narrative now, it's gonna, it's gonna tarnish the Ukraine relationship. It's gonna make it more partisan. And you know, the one piece of advice that you know was consistently given to Ukrainian <coughs> governments by our diplomats was, do not concern, don't get involved in U.S. politics. Mm -hmm. You know, and that was good advice because ultimately, someday possibly, the Democrats will be back in power, and that relationship might be broken because of some of these. Okay, um, and, it, and it regardless, it sort of undermines the innocent victim narrative. And I think the innocent victim narrative is vital to the survival of Ukraine. Being perceived as the victim of Russian aggression, being perceived as the victim of you know, international forces that they are powerless to control, is really part and parcel of what builds support for assistance to Ukraine. You take away their innocent victim narrative, and they become the country where you can buy anything, and they're in trouble. It's a country that's in a lot of trouble. Okay, um, and it's interesting also in this narrative that the reason why the Trump administration thought that they could get Zelensky to do these things is because they had already been getting these things from Russia. And, the, and it's, it's very unlikely that Poroshenko was not aware of these things if, if his, if his uh, um, Prosecutor General and his Minister of Internal Affairs were actively collaborating. 
The other piece of damage, I think, that has been done, and that's kind of come out, and this was coming out in the fall, too, uh, is to the Ukrainian expert community, uh, both inside and outside the government. Uh, the diaspora is a little bit toxic right now, right? <coughs> You know, Andrea Chalupa is constantly mentioned in the in the house, right? And this is seen as you know, uh, foreign influence efforts by the um, by the diaspora community to interfere in our domestic politics and sort of drawing on uh, ties to Ukraine to get Ukrainian influence in these domestic politics. That's very much a Republican narrative, partly based on that political article, but it's also partly true. And this is a this is a concern, right? Um, also, uh, you know, a lot of our uh, expert community, the think tanks in Washington, have become tainted. Uh, the Atlantic Council took money from Burisma, lots of money. Uh, and some key figures, uh, you know, sort of former ambassadors that are affiliated with the Atlantic Council are now also somewhat tainted. It looks a little bit like a pay-to-play system uh, in Washington. Pinchuk's money is under much more scrutiny than it was. Right? These are seen less as just benevolent benefactors who, who provide for a better understanding of Ukraine. They start to look a little bit like uh, lobby right? uh, and international influence. And I think that's, that's dangerous. And over the past two decades, we've seen a move away from, say, tenured professors and people who are more independent uh, in the consulting and policy making in Washington, D.C toward these well-funded think tanks where much of the money is coming from the outside, and this exposed a lot of that. We've seen a lot of that in, in, in recent months. Kurt Volker being a perfect example, right? Kurt Volker, a central person for resolving the Donbass conflict, right? A central person for really assisting Ukraine in managing this, this war, right? Kurt Volker, not paid by the US government. Kurt Volker, paid by his lobbying firm, and his lobbying firm was being paid by Petro Poroshenko, the government. Right? Now granted, they made very clear that the money that was specifically coming from those specific dollars were not going into the hands of Kurt Volker, but it still looks bad. Right? Our envoy, the US envoy, is not being paid by us. He's being paid by the country, or the, the lobbying firm that is in turn being paid by the country that he is supposed to be an envoy to. Complicated. Right? Looks like corruption. Right? Inside Washington, there's a lot of talk about this. And there's a lot more scrutiny about it. And people are questioned right? about you know, where they're getting their resources. And it just, you know, it's not a fun environment there. Um, US government experts, the people inside the government, this is basically a class of people has been decapitated. Right? Virtually every senior official who worked on the relationship with Ukraine either testified and is now an outcast, uh, or uh, has you know, resigned or been denounced in some form or another. It's a loss of expertise. Right? And to be honest, we didn't have that much expertise. Right? So I think <laughs> you know, it's not like we had you know, <coughs> brains to spare in this situation. Right? And so you know, just depending on what you think about the influence of the US government on Right? And you can have positive or negative views of the influence of the U.S. government, right? or positive negative views of, say, the Atlantic Council and the narrative that they were putting out. Right? It still put Ukraine, you know, sort of on the radar and on the funding path for Congress in a way that may now disappear because of these communities being uh, somewhat marginalized at the moment uh, and depleted uh, because of this. Because of this crisis. So I think that these two things, both the, the sort of new facts changing the narrative, and a lot of the people that sustained that old narrative being tainted or removed, makes me cautious about what's coming down the road uh, for Ukraine and US relations. Uh, I mean, the, the good news is, I think, that. Uh, that Zelensky has, has managed to create a very good government. And he is doing a lot of the things that US policy has wanted Ukrainian governments to do over the past 25 years. 
And so maybe doing that without a whole lot of US backing, right? And you know, with a sort of cordon sanitaire, you know, around US politics and not discussing it, and clearly not getting involved. In other words, I don't think that there's the same level of lobbying going on. Uh, that there was uh, in the past because that has been, uh, been called into question. Maybe that's going to turn out fine, but I think there's reason to be concerned. I'll, I'll just raise those concerns and leave it with that. Thanks so much. <laughs> so you and I are going to pass the mic. I'll wrap the mic and we'll pass the mic. Yeah. 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 And then Alex, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Whoa! I'm all right. Well, so much for my uh, <laughs> second dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> I, I said that to every single speaker. Just watch down there. Yeah, thanks. I said we were losing Ukraine. Yes, is that right? I'm good. Thank you. Um, so, so those were all really amazing and informative presentations. So, so thanks to all of you. And I'm trying to wrap my head around how many moving pieces there are in this interview, right? There's a moving piece about how this is playing out in Ukraine, which is technically the title of our event today. You know, what's public opinion? What are perceptions about US credibility um, as a partner? It's reliability, um, you know, it's commitment um, to sort of, you know, upholding normative values and so forth. Then there is a question of sort of the U.S. image in the world, right, and how you know, this, 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 this situation is affecting that. It's its own relationship with Ukraine and its own, um, by extension, role in mediating or being involved in the resolution of the conflict and so forth. But then I think Keith really also put his finger on there's this kind of transnational dimension that emerges out of this. In other words, it's not just about the sort of official bilateral relations that we have going on and how one country does or doesn't affect each other's sort of domestic politics. I think one of the really interesting um, investigative agendas that's come out um, relates directly to this politics of knowledge production about the area. And this, I would, you know, to complicate things even further, I would bring aspects that are settled aspects of the Mueller probe into this conversation too, right? To add to sort of our understanding of how do some of these transnational networks of political advisors, capital, um, image crafting, think tanks, funders, oligarchs, right? How does this operate? What are its rules? Like we're not meant to sort of say that it's a thing. And, 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 and the one thing I would bring up in this context is for everyone to have a look, if you haven't already, um, at the Skadden Arbs settlement with the Department of Justice, which was a spin-off of um, the DOJ investigation. And just, you know, I'm not gonna get into the details, but basically this is an extraordinary document, what sort of Skadden Arbs admitted to, which is basically accepting a $4 million payment to conduct a PR campaign um, <clears throat> that uh, you know, pushes out that you know, the, uh, the trial and imprisonment of Yulia Tymoshenko um, was uh, uh, you know, on the up and up. But what's more interesting about that from an analytical sort of point of view is then how then the proffer maps out who the players were. And they were think tanks involved. They were groups, the Habsburg groups, of, you know, distinguished sort of former European diplomats and journalists who were in on it and so forth. So all this to say, sort of, you know, there's a lot of really interesting veins and research agendas going on here. Uh, and many of you have sort of, you know, hinted at that you would like to find out a little bit more about this. So I think, my, you know, my first question would be, given everything that you've discovered over the last sort of, you know, four or five months and the things that you're probing, um, what would be on your ideal wish list, right? If you had funding and resources and teams of you know, fellow co-authors and investigators, what do you think have emerged as you know, issues that are either unexpected or counterintuitive um, that you would want to probe, either on the American side, the Ukrainian side, or this in-between sort of transnational side? And we can start with whoever wants to start that. 
Um, I, I would like to see, some organizations are highly transparent in the, in the resources that they receive, uh, but some, even within organizations like the Atlantic Council, which does you know, publish its list of donors, sometimes they're very vague. <laughs> like they're you know, essentially shell companies and we're not familiar, yeah. sometimes they're anonymous donors. And so um, I would actually like to see more, I know it's terrible to say these things, but like you know, more federal money. In other words, I, I think taxpayers should be funding the Ooh. research that is supposed to be in the public's, in the nation's interest. Can you right? explain that a little bit more? Because a lot of what we hear is that, well, you know, area studies, why should we waste taxpayer money on area studies when sources of revenues can be found in other sort of places and universities already have you know, such funds anyway? Yeah, because if we don't fund it, the Saudis fund it. Somebody <laughs> funds it. You know, like, it's just, it's problematic to have uh, funding contingent on particularly non-democratic regimes supplying the resources to study those regimes. Uh, yeah. and, but not even just with non-democratic regimes. I think it's, it's important to have, uh, if what you're trying to create is the knowledge that is the basis for good policy, it's good to have it be the, you know, coming from the people who are supposed to be the beneficiaries of that policy. So taxpayers, in my view, right? You don't necessarily want to have government-controlled think tanks either. Right, so there has to be some degree of autonomy built in, but that's why you know, like this is why it sounds funny because I'm at a university, but I do think that funding universities and funding area studies at universities is a good way to go forward in the sense that we have mechanisms for maintaining independence. Right, as a tenured faculty member, I can say things that will upset people a lot. Right. And I upset people a lot on the train. Right? Yeah. But it, you know, but it means that if I'm on a panel with, you know, three people from the Atlantic Council that I subsequently learned and, and Taras Cusio, you know, and I subsequently learned that they are, you know, on the payroll of some of the people that, that we are discussing that day, that's problematic. Right? I look like the marginal outsider when I'm actually the only independent person there. And we should be stalking our expert community with people who are independent. Can I ask? Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask? Oh, you can go for another one. So fund us to do the stuff we do, right? <laughs> OK. I, I think actually, maybe I'll say something that will make me an unlikable person, but it won't be the first time. We need a reality check. We're part of this problem as well, including some of us who are sitting up here, or maybe in the room. And Puerto Tarascuzio has been named, but I was going to tell you three stories where I think the reality check and we all knew about it. When we hear a person uh, amongst us speak positively about one political candidate, uh, and then within a few years change completely to that opponent, we know that person is being paid, and we should prob probably engage with them differently when we're in these kinds of settings. Um, but also, we've been approached by various intelligence agencies in 2014 because people did not know who to turn to, and we did very little about that thereafter. Um, I'm sure I'm not the only one who's been approached by political actors in Ukraine to via various PR firms to uh, support them and their candidacy. I never <laughs> accepted any of those authors. But I know people, I, I've, I've seen the lists of who they approached. So that's the who's who of political science <coughs> in North America and the United Kingdom. So I might be saying no, but I know a few people have said yes. So I think we're part of that uh, issue here. Um, and so I, I worry that sometimes any further investigations will actually a few academics will show up that we perhaps aren't expecting to. Um, and the reality check also in the way that we speak uh, personally, privately, over email and in messages, we know all this stuff because of WhatsApp messages. Um, we're, you know, I'm sure that how we sit now and we think, how stupid could they have been to write all of this in so clearly in messages back and forth? Well, again, I think some people who may have advised 
from the governments at some point in time. And they have also exchanged some silly messages over Facebook and WhatsApp. And these are academics. <laughs> if that came out, it would also be quite embarrassing. So I think the reality is what it is. We also need a reality check of our involvement in it. Um, and maybe stop pretending that it's just the, the evil lobbyists in places like DC that are the problem. Yeah, I just, but fund us. Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> I'll second the part about fundus, but I also want to say something that might seem a little naive, yeah, but to your question, right, like what kind of would like to know more. It kind of strikes me as really interesting, like how the politicians, you know, in Ukraine in particular, think that they paying this kind of money can get them what they want, right? Mm -hmm. Like that you, you hire lobbyists, you pay, you know, this PR firm, and then like you have 11% support or whatever it is, and all of a sudden you're going to win elections. Like, really, like, what, I mean, with this WhatsApp messages, right? Like, what was Trump going to do to increase Poroshenko's election chances? Like, I kind of scratch my head. I don't know. I mean, they must have thought of something, but to me, it seems like very, first of all, kind of. Maybe naive is not the right word, but I mean delusional. Um, <laughs> disregarding the people, I mean, like again, that might sound. But I mean, people basically had a say, and you know, we we've seen this again and again, right? Yanukovych tried to do this, right? Like all of this campaign for him in Moscow, like with money and all of this, and then it didn't work out that way, right? And you would think after seeing their predecessors sort of try and fail, right? They would think. A little bit harder as to would this really get me what I want, right? I'm gonna hire this fancy PR firm. Are they sort of? I mean, yes. In the way, in one hand, they are manipulating. I think this money is. I agree with what both of you said. And the money is the um, the expert, you know, the expertise that comes out. But I think they are also getting in some way short heads of the stick, right? Yeah, like yeah. They're spending all this money and they're not really getting the return for it. So I would be very like my flesh to be a fly on the wall and to hear like when Lutsenko strategized with Poroshenko, right? Like how like we are gonna give them this thing on Burisma and then Trump is gonna do what exactly to help Poroshenko win? Like I don't know. But I, don't know. I think the translation of what uh, what Lutsenko said that he was getting out of this was uh, was fuck all. <laughs> uh, yes, if, if you remove that like, Yeah, but I, I yeah, okay. So I admit my, my pride's a little hurt. I haven't been approached. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I know. I don't believe it. 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 Relates it, but uh, more broadly, the role of the United States in Western Europe uh, and in local corruption in places like Ukraine. Now, what you've written a lot about this this notion of transnational roles in local corruption, the extent to which the types of places that we call extremely corrupt, the corruption persists in large part because there's places to put your money outside of that country, um, and because you're, um, in some cases, just blatantly having foreign actors who are engaging in that corruption. And, and some of the things that have happened in, in recent, you know, not, not just since Ukraine scandal, but just under the Trump administration, I think these are things that existed before, but they, they because they're always done in this institutionalized way, at least once you get outside the place where there's not institutions, but once you step back into the Western world, it was always done just up to the line where you could call it legal enough that people kind of didn't really want to go there in terms of saying, no, we're really corrupt or we're really helping corruption. Right. Now we live in a world where I think a lot of people are saying that because you just can't say something different. Um, and you look even just you know, at Manafort, for example, and it seems like if, if he had just stayed away from Trump, he'd still be doing what he's doing. What are you always been doing? I mean, there's, you know, there's no, these people are just not even on the radar screen of law enforcement, uh, at least of all, um, you know, at least well, academic research on corruption or yeah. something. So uh, I don't think anyone really wants to give a bunch of money to academics to study US <laughs> international <laughs> corruption, but I do think that would be really interesting. And, and again, I think it's an old problem, but it's just made so much more clear cut by this administration in general and the Ukraine scandal. All right, so, so Alex's first question, I think, went to one of the darkest places <laughs> in all of, the, in all of the, the discussions and the remarks. So let me try to, I want to pull on another theme that was, that was brought up by a lot of the talks, which is the sort of more, uh, the, the less dark place, the bright place that seemed to come across in lots of these stories, which is just that, you know, when we set this thing up, 
we would we we kind of thought well maybe we'll be talking about like how this has ruined Zelensky's anti-corruption uh, anti-corruption credentials and this is what he ran for office on and once again we're right back where you have a Ukrainian leader who's got 20 per 20 percentage point support you know like one of the things that always you know that shocked me about about um, the Orange Revolution is that you know the, the trick you know how do you get rid of a Ukrainian president you wait till the next election right like you don't have to do these other things and yet. And yet, we're sitting here talking right now about Zelensky, and we're saying it in a positive sense. And his approval ratings are super high. And in multiple remarks from multiple, so Jordan, you showed us the numbers, but also all of the other speakers, you know, this, this comes out as like, the question is, how much does this help Zelensky? How has he been able to, you know, how, and, and there's an underlying narrative of a, a naive, you know, potentially naive or not so naive, but we have essentially someone who goes from television who is you know, a, a TV actor who famously you know, played someone, an ordinary person who becomes president, who becomes president with this landslide victory and all of a sudden gets hit with perhaps the most you know, unimaginable, the, the, the one who's supposed to be backing up as the sort of key ally is now putting in this, in this situation. And we're not sitting here talking about how it undermined all of the, the sort of anti-corruption credentials that were going into this thing. So the question I have that I wanna push to you is like, how did this happen? Like, what's the story? Why are we not sitting, I mean, like, we're talking about Trump and all the mistakes of the Trump administration because this was a non-professional politician who was a celebrity who came out of TV, you know, who now has no expertise left at the State Department, has managed to alienate everybody, you know, people are firing, they have to do coherence to policy, letting this sideways policy being run, and yet we're talking about Zelensky from a country who is facing both the challenges of corruption and the challenges of, of Donbass and war and peace, who also has been in office much shorter period of time, doesn't have the sort of resources that the United States has. You know, you can make a lot of mistakes as president of the United States and still be able to, you know, cruise by on the on the you know fifteen trillion dollar GNP or whatever whatnot. So my question is, how? Like, what's what? Did we miss something here? as well about Zelensky. Uh, oh, and you, you hinted at this where you sort of said, oh, maybe he's not as, he was not as naive as we thought he was, or maybe he had better advisors. And, and Keith, to your point of like, what is this gonna teach us as scholars? Like, it seemed like, you know, this was, what this was teaching us is we're getting another totally unprepared candidate who's gonna be president, who doesn't, you know, who hasn't come out of any experience in politics. What do we take away from this? What's, what's the story behind this? Why? Does Zelensky come out of this looking looking well? But not even that. Why does it seem like he came out of it making very principled decisions, which is not something we normally talk about with Ukrainian politicians, right? Like, why does he? What happened that put him in this situation where he ends up uh, he ends up making the kind of choices that they made when faced with this when they first came to power, and then coming out of this process? you know, still with the overwhelming, you know, support of the population. So I'd love to hear more about that side of it. And you also touched on it, so I'd like to hear a little bit more on your thoughts on it. Yeah, I'll say just two quick <laughs> words on it. I have two theories, an optimistic and a pessimistic one. Uh, the optimistic one is part of the story told today that Ukrainians just have a lot more important things to think about than U.S. impeachment. And so to the extent that there's any sort of uh, influence on, on how they think about Zelensky, it's just not coming from this. It's gonna come from things that they're looking at domestically, and then we have a different question about how is it that Zelensky's maintaining some level of support? Is it true that he's actually fighting corruption and so on, and do people still believe that? But I think it's somewhat surprisingly, from our perspective of Americans, but, but it, it does not seem to be heavily influenced by the question about impeachment as a separate issue. Uh, that would be the optimistic one. The, the, my, my, Pessimistic, more cynical one is that just Ukrainians, I think quite rightly, are, have a very low bar for what they expect out of Zelensky and out of anybody in it who puts on a politician's you know, costume at this point, and so, or bureaucrat's costume or anything, anything in power, business, or politics. And so it's, you know, you could, you could do, you could say some pretty horrific things and still have people shrug and go, yeah, it's better than usual. Um, so that's, that's my pessimistic interpretation. I'm not sure which is right, maybe a combination. So, so there's different ways of reading um, Zelensky's approval ratings, right? So last one from Keith is about 66% when people are just asked, do you approve how the president's doing? That is much higher than Poroshenko had at the same time. Okay, so just to keep that in mind. 
if Voroshenko's current rating is in double digit negatives, I can't remember the exact number, and so on and so forth. Um, I think the thing here, and I may have been one of those people about a year ago as well, is, um, and I don't think we're alone in, in, in or Trump was alone in, in m m misunderstanding Zelensky and the phenomenon behind it. Um, a lot of people, I think, got it wrong. So first of all, he's, when you speak to people who know him very well, they say he's a very shrewd uh, businessman. Um, and I, I know at least one person that knows him extremely well, that has worked with him for many, many years, and he said, this is no dummy. You're getting it wrong. I, at the time, thought I was getting it right. Um, but I was getting it wrong. It turns out he, he knows how to build the right team around him, even if, as Juan Toruk said <laughs> on the recorded tapes recently, he has a very naive idea, uh, perspective on economics. So I think we're, we're not alone there. Um, and uh, I, 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 so I, don't know, I don't know how to explain it beyond that, that many of us got it wrong. Um, the entire Kiev elite got it wrong. And they're enabled actually to now readjust their thinking. I think that is far more dangerous. Um, not being able to now go on, in some <coughs> people's cases, some politicians' cases, and some academics' cases, not being able to now see him as a good leader, the team he built as a good team, and because that actually creates, um, I think you can only push <coughs> a team and a person so far before something, some opportunity opens up. But I'm not going to a happy place. If you want a happy place, I'm not going there. I think we're in the danger of uh, alienating a huge portion of the Ukrainian electorate which continue to support him. And uh, there's a group of people that are working very hard to do good things and they keep getting pushed and pushed by both outside and inside intellectual elites. And I think that can create a very dangerous atmosphere. Um, I'll just add a couple of <coughs> more thoughts. I mean, I don't have a definitive answer, obviously, but uh, one thing that in which the way in which Zelensky is different from even politicians like Trump or other populist politicians, he didn't really have any kind of strong ideological sort of like being far right or being like anti-immigrant or being right, you know, catering to evangelicals. Like his base was really non-ideological, right? Or, or maybe better put it, like it united people who may have sort of had different ideological preferences, but who were united around this, like we had enough of corruption and we were peace, right? And also, and this is some, this goes to the point of sort of what can we learn as scholars, right? Like who is there to kind of oppose him, right? Like it's not that Ukraine had this functioning party system, but here we have like okay, the Trump, the Republican Party is you know supporting him for reasons, you know, that we can analyze, and here is the Democratic Party, and we kind of have a choice as a voter, right? Like in Ukraine, we don't really have a structured party system, right? We have this, you know, all of these parties that came before him, I mean, they were, I mean, with the possible exception of the communists, right, and maybe Svoboda, um, kind of with the far left and right ideological extreme, all these parties were very non-ideological, right? Like, what do they have to offer? And Zelensky hasn't done anything, I mean, I think that's another part sort of to his, I think, quite shrewdness, right? He did manage to walk this fine line that he didn't do anything that could, like any side ideologically could seize and say this is completely unacceptable, we can mobilize against this, this is like too pro-Russian, too anti-Russian, or what have you, right? Um, and, and, you know, he's, he still has this credit of support for his anti-corruption uh, move, right? That he had done s several things, probably too early to say if it's going to work out or not, but clearly something is being done, right? The support is there. So um, it is similar, right? Meaning that this sort of outside they came in, but things that are not different is both about Zelensky and his party and kind of general political climate and party structure sort of system in Ukraine that makes it quite distinct. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think he's a very different politician in a lot of ways. And I think that it's not necessarily about um, results. It's about popular perception of intent. I think everyone in, rec in Ukraine recognizes that, you know, it's hard to get to Germany, right? <laughs> like, unless you just pick up and move to Germany like, you know, 30% of the population wants to do. But, you know, I think it's hard institutionally to, to transform a society. And he's very honest about how, to, you know, that was one of the virtues of his television show was actually showing how remarkably difficult that was in a humorous way. Uh, and I, but I think people believe that his intentions are there. And he has selected people uh, to serve in his government who, you know, 
you know, he may not be the greatest expert on the economy, but his Minister of Economy is definitely an expert on the economy. He's chosen people with talent, with courage, and I think that people ultimately uh, appreciate that and see that as different from the past. And so I think, I think, and he also culturally strikes the right tone, you know, like his New Year's Eve speech, like th these were, these are important things to say, you know, sort of the reconciliation with the past, the reconciliation with the South and the East. I think that he creatively unites uh, the country, um, you know, through his sort of statements and symbolic politics in a way that I think, I think because the, <laughs> because we have been in a, a, a bubble uh, in Western commentary that takes one view of Ukrainian identity that is not necessarily a view of Ukrainian identity that is held by the majority of actual Ukrainians. We didn't see that coming. Um, but but Ukrainian, the Ukrainian population is quite amenable to a lot of the things that people thought would be red lines. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I, I continue to be very hopeful about, about the administration. I also think, you know, they were put in a terrible position and they may have done some things that would compromise them, but they're enough of a disciplined administration that they have shut conversation down about that completely. And it's like, yeah, I'm sure that like, Ukrainska Pravda readers would actually care about reading Lev Parnas's texts and, and talking about that. You're not gonna read about it. Right, so that you know, there's still a degree of like the government exercises a degree of control over the media space, and nobody has a great incentive in revealing this material. Birtash has no incentive in revealing it. Ahmedov has no incentive in revealing it. Poroshenko certainly has no incentive in revealing it. So there's like a let's just agree to keep this very very quiet for right now. Um, so. All right, <clears throat> let's turn to the audience now. It's been patiently been waiting for a chance to talk. We'd like to ask, as we're recording this and live streaming this, just to remind you, first of all, that we are recording and live streaming it, but also if you could please identify yourself before asking your question. Um, so, all right, so we've got a lot of hands up. Why don't we go in the back there? Um, I'm curious how significant Burisma is within Ukraine. The Great question. How, how significant is Burisma within Ukraine? Who wants to take that? <laughs> Let's give that to the survey. <laughs> um, I can, I mean, maybe you guys should say more, but I would just say that um, the, you know, first of all, nobody is surprised that there has been a lot of corruption, right? It's Yanukovych's people, so forth, right? But um, I don't, I think it seems like the, my understanding is that the investigations of possible corrupt dealings actually predate the time of Hunter Biden there, right? Like, and that's kind of where, it, I mean, again, from my reading of what's discussed, I'm just ended at that, maybe survey researchers can add more to that. So the only thing I was going to say about your guys' survey, and it's cool that you guys are doing this, is people are going to answer even when they don't know about things, right? And I have a feeling that very few Ukrainians actually know, first of all, what the impeachment process is, and second of all, what parties, in, including this, uh, who the company is. I think very few people know the details. Um, I think many journalists would get the details wrong, and I'm certain many people within the government could get the details wrong, yeah. Okay, sure. Yeah, thanks. Um, one person, very carefully, uh, 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 momentarily mentioned someone who alludes to the elephant that is carefully hiding out of the room, Vladimir Putin. As Nancy Pelosi intuitively says, all those that are <coughs> and you mentioned Manafort. And what we, I'm sure everybody knows, Manafort was, of course, paid by Oleg Deripaska to do great damage to Ukraine. And uh, Deripaska was essentially a cutout for Vladimir Putin. So um, you mentioned Manafort. What I want to point out is that had he not, had not Trump not still not secured the nomination, <coughs> and still had Republican rivals, he would have kept Manafort and we would still have Manafort close to his ear right now. Manafort being an agent essentially of Putin, a higher gun of Putin, I think. So um, this is outside some of your academic purview, but you all have personal opinions, I'm sure, and they're more informed <coughs> than most of us because you're scholars on these topics. 
So I want to be very specific. We're just hearing now about Attorney General Barr uh, being compromised in this investigation because Lev Parnas is revealing that he also is someone that has... We need a question. The question is here. Barr has... Uh, everyone might want to look at it. There was a Newsweek article that talked about Attorney General Barr's also uh, complicated relationship with Russian money. Uh, several banks uh, that he has investment in, small amounts. But what would you think about Attorney General Barr's connection to Ukraine? Has he ever been there? Uh, has he ever been to Russia? Has he ever been supplied with women as the honey trap that, that Putin uses so well on Trump and others? Uh, and I'd like your, each of your opinion about that possibility. I don't have details on Barr, but I'll, I'll just say one thing about Putin more broadly. I don't think Putin needs Deripaska or Manafort. Putin has Putin. Putin gets to talk directly to Trump with nobody else in the room. <laughs> and, and and I don't, you know, I have no more information than anybody else who reads the newspaper about what goes on in these, you know, in, in these private discussions. But there's certainly been a plausible discussion about the extent to which it's Putin and Orban in Hungary who have directly in conversations with Trump, perhaps shaded his views of Ukraine in a negative way. Um, again, I mean, this is hard to verify, but I, I think that would certainly make sense. Uh, it certainly seems plausible to me. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm of course concerned about all the different ways that Russian money goes through various chains and affects US politics, but I think here we have an intriguing one just in the sense of, for whatever reason, obviously there's lots of speculation about this and no, no clear answers, for whatever reason, Putin seems to directly influence Trump when they meet. So I think that's important. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would only say that the, the Mueller report did not have the findings regarding Manaport, Manaport that you're suggesting. And I also had the same intuition that you did, but those were not borne out in evidence. So I think we have to be very careful in thinking about what the ties are. The only country that Manafort was shown definitively to be a foreign agent of was Ukraine. Mm -hmm. so, well, circumcised. Yeah. So I, I'm with you. Like, the the connection from there, and as soon as he yeah. was named the campaign manager for Trump, I was like, you know, like, <laughs> this is crazy. And But nonetheless, we spent a lot of money and had very talented people who do a lot of forensic accounting, and they, they did not come up with the finding that he is an agent of the Kremlin. To me, what William Barr has or hasn't done isn't as interesting as the question of, um, you know, in this era that now the buzz term for political science is weaponized and interdependence. Yes. Right? And so, so the question is, the Department of Justice here has this vast extraterritorial apparatus, right? As the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, as extraterritorial jurisdiction, and so forth. And sort of the ask from Parnas and, 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 and the network and so forth was, to grant a meeting with with Barr to look into uh, you know uh, uh, possibly mitigating or you know amending the pending extradition of Mr. Furtash, right? And so that would then go to a red line that we haven't been before. But there's no evidence that we've crossed that red line, um, and we don't know about all the requests that don't get publicized by the newspapers. And I'll just give you one example of this, right? So President Nazarbayev in Kazakhstan in the 2000s was consumed with a scandal called Kazakhstan, right? The accusation that he had been involved in you know, corrupt uh, uh, energy deals and so forth, and he would regularly ask US government officials, make this go away, please, right? And US officials would say, that's the Department of Justice. They're investigating. Our advice to you is hire a good lawyer, right? Over, over this thing now, getting into this. So, um, so I think, to me, that's the analytical issue whether this sort of extraterritorial architecture that we have can be politicized, right? Can be used in this sort of favorable way. I don't think there's a lot of evidence that this actually happened yet, but I think that's the sort of analytical agenda I would read into it. Please. Thank you, Tom. Really interesting discussion. Thank you. I wanted to hear um, some of the panelists' opinion about how the Zelensky has managed to uh, navigate internationally, especially vis-a-vis -vis Russia, given what looks like a very, very weak position. I mean, um, you know, I have my opinions about why he's uh, 
got to support of the population still. But um, in terms of how he's sometimes seen by the population as um, as maybe not being as strong as um, Poroshenko and being able to stand up to Putin, but then you know it turns out that he, uh, like you were saying, it seemed like he's very very weak coming out of the um, news from the U.S. And then he didn't cancel the the, the Minsk meeting in um, December. And then he sort of you know, stood ground and really um, subverted the expectations of a lot of people. Um, and I, I'm just wondering if you have any sense from reading the recent public opinion data if people are speaking more um, specifically about foreign policy or about Zelensky and his um, ability to stand up to Russia, um, or if we would maybe compare the way the population uh, supported many of Poroshenko's um, stances in this way. Like even people who didn't support Poroshenko domestically were sometimes you know, very supportive of his taking a hard line against Russia. So I, I just have kind of a vague question about if, is there some data that you're familiar with that you haven't discussed yet that maybe speaks to how um, Zelensky manages to um, manages to retain support in this area, or or just if you want to say something about how Zelensky himself um, has, or what the you know, what the local opinion is about how Zelensky himself is manage, managing to form what looks like a very weak structural position still take a um, a cold line. I think. We're actually going to get new data at the end of the month, so I'll probably be able to answer that question with our own data um, a little bit better. But what I think is important, the, the population actually wasn't that supportive of Poroshenko in his later years as president and, and his stance on Russia or the what was happening with Russia and how strong he is in dealing with Russia. So it's not yeah, in Europe. Europe. Sort, of, sort of supportive of his moves for Europe, not necessarily. Yeah, but even so, it, in later years, that dwindled for Poroshenko as well. Um, here, the <coughs> so far it's qu still quite high um, for Zelensky across the board. In, in whether you take Razumkov or Knuth's data, it's still quite high. Um, and I think in focus groups that Knuth, oh, I may be mistaken, it might have not been Knuth, but I was recently talking to a sociologist, and they said that people were saying he seems to be more realistic and not just taking the hard talking points, right? So it seemed like Poroshenko said the right things maybe, but everyone knew that that wasn't the realistic thing that would happen. Whereas uh, apparently, ordinary Ukrainians are seeing the real talk coming out of Zelensky more honest. Um, that's at least what some, I'll see what my data says, but I have a feeling that that's true. I think the, the positive response to Zelensky is about a lot of Ukrainians, the broad majority, not the ones that call themselves the 25%, um, the staunch Poroshenko and Holos supporters, but all the rest actually see that there's a compromise that's needed, see that different kind of stance needs to be taken, and actually don't think Zelensky isn't uh, doing the right things when it comes to that. They think he's still defending the Ukrainian state as he should be. So, um, does that? Could I follow up? Because Josh and I talked about this, but I was thinking maybe in some strange <coughs> way this impeachment episode actually um, strengthens the autonomy and strengthens Zelensky's position because it op uh, uh, takes him out of that bind where <coughs> Ukraine is pulled between Russia and the US, mm -hmm. and maybe in a way it makes Russia sort of feel like, well, we don't have to now fight against the US, we kind of have to deal with Ukraine as Ukraine, or Zelensky as representing Ukraine. So I just wonder if there's like any kind of, if anybody else had this sort of th thought about opening up a kind of bigger space for Zelensky in his negotiations with Russia. I just actually I don't I think that's a little bit too optimistic. I mean, what you just said, but but uh, to follow up on some of what Ola said, I think when with Poroshenko, right? I think it's important to I mean, and it, with Poroshenko, it was it became it became impossible to distinguish by the end kind of the posturing and the substance, right? Because on substantive issues, there were some sort of legitimate concerns for Ukrainian sovereignty and you know things that he was standing for. But I think this whole kind of anti-Russian narrative and this whole you know kind of it's almost like intangible, right? Like that was basically impossible. And I think Russians, like they talked about it privately, knew that they were really pissed about uh, just kind of the, the nature of the dialogue and kind of the accusations and sort of the vocabulary and so forth. And Zelensky didn't have to deal with that, right? So he did have the kind of, in that sense, some sense, clean start, right? 
But then I think when it came to the substantive issues, right, like say such as federalism, right, or you know, elections on certain terms, like I don't see, I mean, you're saying that he was in a weaker position, maybe I'm not <coughs> understanding your question. I'm not sure, like, why would we expect that he would give in on this? Like, I don't think there was any reason to expect that he would necessarily agree, say, to things such as like federalizing Ukraine, right, or giving these um, regions in the, in the Donetsk veto power over foreign policy decisions, right? But, but because he didn't have this baggage of kind of negativity and this long history of animosity, right, he could address more concrete things, right? Like say, the pensioners who don't get their pensions, right, and they have supposed to cross every like 30 days. Why do they have to cross every 30 days? Maybe they can cross every 90 days and we can figure out like how else, right, to deal with the money, right? And this things like even symbolic things like shaking Putin's hand or not shaking Putin's hand, right? Like, so in a way, like I'm not that surprised because I think when you kind of parcel what he actually had done, right, like in, in Normandy. I think when it came to real red lines, he didn't give in. And I don't think, like, maybe I'm, as I said, I'm not sure I understand you're saying he came from a weaker position. I don't think there was any kind of reason to expect <coughs> that he would, like, why would he, right? And yet, exactly because there was no baggage, right, and there was a fresh start, I think he was able to accomplish what he could within the constraints that he had, right? And he agreed that he and Putin don't agree on certain things, and there was no progress on these things. And yet, on the other things, they were able to achieve some things. So. I guess I was saying that he was maybe less weaker than my good question implies. Yeah, and you know, sort of, I spent some time with the Russian side on these issues, and, and <laughs> they, you know, it's good not to caricature them, and, and they also are willing to negotiate and to move towards settlement on some basic humanitarian issues, and and that's what we've seen, uh, and so I think actually. <coughs> there's a decent uh, probability that Poroshenko benefited from the non-resolution of the conflict. At least he perceived that uh, having, um, partly because it fed the victim narrative, which then fed Western assistance. Um, but I think Zelensky feels that um, he would like to resolve this. Uh, and the Russians are aware that his domestic position is somewhat vulnerable and that there are real constraints on, on his negotiating position. They don't ask him to do things that he can't do. People will just let it be a frozen conflict until it can move forward. Um, but we've seen it move forward incrementally, and like, you know, that's how, you know, complicated peace negotiations work. You know, through you know three checkpoints, you know, this quarter, and then another checkpoint the next quarter, and then people stop killing each other for a certain period of time, and then it becomes more normalized. Then becomes more imaginable for that territory to become part of Ukraine for that population because the interaction increases. And I just think, you know, this is not going to be a something that's solved overnight and it's not going to go switch straight to federalism. That's not going to happen. But I do think that the Russians are also aware of that and they are they're having good negotiations now is my understanding. The negotiations are actually uh, possible. Yes. Uh, as to Professor Gordon, uh, I'm, uh, I'm the executive director of something called the Center for U.S. Foreign Relations. We run uh, nearly 100 uh, conferences in the last 20 years. But everyone that you've talked about uh, who has testified in the impeachment proceedings, uh, or pre-impeachment proceedings, has probably gone to our conferences. And we actually have an information network now that we use amongst those those individuals. And I probably would beg to differ with you. I, I like your assessment of Zelensky, but I would beg to differ with you on what our is and what that means in the last two, three days. Uh, first by Franklin Foyer, a very interesting piece, and then a piece yesterday by Natasha Bertrand, indicate that our may in fact be one of those characters uh, that's beloved by, by, by the Kremlin, by Putin because it stirs crap on both sides. In effect, he started by going to Giuliani and his friend Sam Kislin and Brighton uh, Mob um, and started that process and uh, was promising one thing. And now he's actually in the process of being poisoned pill and going after Trump's people, including Bill Barr, as you mentioned. So in effect, what we've, we're, we're finding is the pattern. You're absolutely right that you can't possibly say, well, Foyer's the sense of Arnaz uh, doing Firtash. Is Firtash really a cutout, the way Osman says he's a cutout? My friend Anders says he's a cutout. 
But in some ways, isn't it possible that that's precisely what's going on? You know, all you need is the Norwegian uh, network yeah. occupied, and, they, and the Russians are perceived in that way. They don't directly do this. This is a new form of desinform. I guess I'm old enough to remember the 70s and 80s and how desinform used to be, and now it's a new form. So I'm directing it to you, sir. Uh, is it possible that, in fact, Farnes, and the more that we get very good reporters on Farnes, we may find that there is a direct connection to the Kremlin, and it is about stirring chaos in the United States as they stir chaos in Ukraine? I think that's very likely. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, it's, you know, that all roads lead to fear touch. <laughs> would be my, you know, like that, you know, yes. but, but yes. I also yes. felt that all roads led to Deripaska and that led to the Kremlin yes. too, so I, I have to be very careful right. with, you know, my conspiracy theorizing. Right? <laughs> uh, but Parnas, you know, it, both the lawyers, you know, Victoria Tunsing and, and her husband, right, like, and John Solomon, like, uh, all these people are in some way tied to Firtash. And so, and you could see why Firtash would just drop a bomb in the whole thing because he did not get the one thing he wanted, yep. yes. which is he is still, you know, being extradited. Yes. And so you could see, you know, the question is like, why would somebody like Lev Parnas turn, right? And it is precisely because he's still an agent of somebody who wants to blow this all up. But that doesn't mean it won't be successful in blowing all this up. Very good. Because those texts are real. And he did have all these ties with these people. And that just, you know, it's successful disinformation. Yes. Why isn't Parnas's friend talking? The other Fruman? guy. Yeah, I forgot his Fruman, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> I don't know. He just has a different lawyer? Maybe. I mean, the other theory about why Parnas is talking is because that's the only way he's going to stay alive. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because otherwise, you know, clearly he had a lot of contact with a lot of people and he knows way too much. And so spilling it all is the only way to keep yourself alive. Yeah. I'm Dora Komiak. I'm going to shift from the conspiracy theories and move into the after party. Good. And I'm really curious to hear, yeah, that's, that's good. Um, I'm curious to hear from each of you, what kind of advice would you give or are you giving to this caved elite? that you mentioned that's having a tough time turning and grasping Zelensky, right? And you've all mentioned that you're part of a bubble. I mean, we're all part of this bubble, right? And kind of have a tough time kind of going, who is this guy? Um, but the bare facts are a lot of people voting for him and a lot of people are supporting him. So what kind of tools and tri tricks and tactics have you used or that you would advise people in KU? who are the elite leaders to kind of grasp Zelensky and his supporters. That's a great question. Should we bundle that with one more and then have everyone give a final comment? Sure. Yeah, yeah. So more. yeah uh, thank you so much for your comments. I've been uh, reporting on all this for six months, so my brain is working. <laughs> uh, I wanted to follow up what Alex was saying, and that is your comments about you know what we're going through here. What does this say about the foreign policy of the United States? This impeachment process, these hearings, etc. Is this just a microcosm of other parts of the world in terms of what we're seeing, the transact transactional nature of Trump we know already? So what are we seeing that we can generalize for the rest of the world in other aspects that were seen in this incredible case of Ukraine? And finally, of course, people should watch Server of People because that's a great time. <laughs> <laughs> that really gives you a good sense of how it's funny and how it got elected. Certainly not the you know, press. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, so we'll give everybody a chance to answer these last couple questions and also offer any other closing remarks you like. In a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> I'm not going to touch on that, and there's probably people that can speak more to that, but your question is something that's very personal to me. My, this is live streamed and I'm very aware that some of the people I spoke about, the so-called Kiev elite, are my friends and family. And, you know, it, it's many personal conversations that we've had over the past few months, including tears and drunken yelling. So uh, that's the personal side. And then there's, I think the- Not a lot of drunken whispering. <laughs> <laughs> there could be, there could be, that could be. 
Um, why I say this? Because that's the, 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 the personal element of this for me. Um, the other, the truth is, the Kiev intellectual elite is having a very hard time coming to terms with the fact that a lot of intelligent people, not only some idiots, voted for a person that happens to be doing kind of okay, and in everything that he or his government does, they try to find something that they disagree with. And then they disagree with it so passionately and emotionally that they miss the sliver of good that Oksana has been mentioning. And those slivers of good could potentially lead to something very good, yeah? And I, I don't know how to have these conversations without the tears and drunken yelling because it's emotional <coughs> for people. Uh, they either emotionally, it's, it's either cognitive or whatever, it, they are unable to come to terms with the fact that he might not be selling Ukraine to Putin, in fact, and that many Ukrainians do not view the same type of Ukraine that they view, right, when it comes to identity, language, or whatever. And it's really difficult. Um, I, on, again, on personal grounds, I agree with them when it comes to Ukrainian language. I agree with them when it comes to certain policies. I agree with them. Yet the general population is not on board there. And he seems to have found a way to speak to the broader population of Ukraine. And I'm worried, and again, it goes back to the point I made earlier. I'm worried that it's, they're unable to take this on board. It's, it's <coughs> cognitive. The so more you tell them. Fund a bunch of gift certificates for therapy. <laughs> yeah, the more it's yeah, it's a cognitive bias. The, the more the bias, the more you tell them that this is the case, the less they're likely to believe it. And these are again very experienced, smart individuals. But for some reason, it's just not happening. I don't know. Maybe the people I spoke with had less to drink for it, and maybe that's a little <laughs> more amenable. But I actually was quite optimistic because I think this knee-jerk reaction, all is talking about, I think that's true. Many people do have this; they kind of reject, right, and they. But then they, they try to project on Zelensky sort of the betrayals with Israeli at the same Ukraine that he actually hasn't done. Yeah. And then like if you you know in a quiet like in a calm conversation, they're able to see this. They may not acknowledge it or certainly like not like publicly, yeah. exactly, right? But I don't I don't see this sort of mobilization against Zelensky as say that say that was against Yanukovych by that very same elite, right? Because like Yanukovych clearly was like in a different sort of closer to Russia, you know, willing to sell off a lot of things, right? And the, the, the discourse may look similar, as in like, oh, he's selling, you know, but it, as far as, like, they know that he's not, right? And I don't, I don't think they would be, like, mobilizing against him in the same way. And it may just take some time, right? And certainly he would do something that people would disagree about, and we don't have time to go into detail, but there was this whole controversy that I followed closely just because it's something I work on over the appointment of this head of the religious um, the department and ministry of culture who would deal with religion and, like, so there are certain things that you know one can kind of legitimate have legitimate grievances, right? But as Ola is saying, there are also things that he either has done positively or certainly hasn't done negatively, right? And people just have to kind of figure out that's like, yeah, that that's okay. That's a new kind of era in Ukrainian politics. We have this Jewish Russian speaking, you know, president who actually is pro-Ukrainian. Like who would have thought, right? But, <laughs> uh, but here we are, right? And the same idea yeah, that people may have to rethink some of their stereotypes. Yeah, I mean, I would say the essential feature of nationalism is the belief that you should only be ruled by your own kind, by a member of your own people, and that there is a subset of the Ukrainian population, particularly in the diaspora, that does not see a Russian-speaking Jew as one of their own people. And that has been a fundamental impediment, but that fortunately, the vast majority of Ukrainians do see him as a member of their own people and a, and a great representative of what it is to be a Ukrainian. And so I would say, I, I mean, I never had this problem. I was never a fan of Petro Poroshenko. So like, and that created a lot of tension with people that I respect a lot <coughs> in the campaign uh, who fell on the other side of that. Um, but I would say that um, I have seen a lot of uh, shifting, actually, of people who were vehemently opposed and sort of said, you know, he's just the puppet of Kolmoisky to come around and become part of the government and say, you know, actually the guy's really open and wants to make these changes, and he is going to be the puppet of somebody like Kolmoisky if, you know, the people from Golis or whatever don't step up and step into positions, and he is welcoming that, right? 
And so, you know, it was kind of an unwritten script about what was going to happen after the election. And the more elites sort of accept that this is a, a possibly a good thing, and this is a good cultural vehicle for a lot of the political and economic reforms that they would like to see happen in Ukraine, they can get comfortable with that. Ukraine's going to be in a very good place. On that optimistic note, right? Yeah. <laughs> I almost don't want to say something because that was so optimistic and I feel like uh, I was going to take a, a slightly more pessimistic uh, take. So I'll, I'll answer the other question so that I can avoid that, but I'll leave us on a maybe pessimistic note about America, so I, I apologize for that. But at least we'll leave Zelensky and, and, and Ukraine in a, in a positive note. Um, it's not so much even what this tells us, what the, the Ukraine's camp tells us about Trump's transactional interactions, but I, I think it does tell us a lot about that. But I just want to say more broadly, uh, there's a number of very concrete things that are going on in the Trump administration in terms of undermining traditional roles in terms of the US in terms of fighting corruption. There's a recent report about Trump's ongoing efforts to undercut the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, mm -hmm. um, which is quite remarkable. I mean, because the types of things that he's grumbling about in terms of this putting US companies at a disadvantage and so on made sense several decades ago when we were the leading country in terms of pushing this type of law, but now this law exists all throughout Europe and, and is much more standard. Maybe it puts some companies at disadvantages, but it's quite remarkable to have a US president thinking this way. Uh, there's also examples with a you know, really interesting experiment that was working fairly well in Guatemala with an, an external commission that was basically run by, by you know, international legal experts and, 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 and prosecutors um, as a way to basically supplement a judiciary that could not fight high-level corruption and, and cartels and things like that. Um, and because the Trump administration didn't keep the support of that, it's gone. Um, and, it, and the story behind it, it um, this is not my expertise, but my understanding is it came from direct lobbying from, a pre from high people in Guatemala who were around the president, who their president was going to be investigated by this and lobbied DC to get access to the Trump administration and say, this is exactly the type of thing you don't like, this is multinational, you know, US everywhere type international stuff, don't back this, and that's gone. And that was an interesting experiment. Um, and so those are just two examples, but uh, the extent to which the US has gone from uh, doing, you know, maybe ineffective sometimes, but, but I think legitimately internationally trying to fight corruption in various ways, that's not happening anymore. And so I find that quite disturbing. But like I said, I apologize for leaving us on a negative note. <laughs> Maybe Josh is something more positive to say. So I'm gonna let Alex take us out, but I wanna before <laughs> doing that, I want to um, I want to thank everyone. It's it's a real pleasure to be able to bring this distinguished panel into here to speak. But it's also a real pleasure to speak in front of such a knowledgeable audience, and it's been great questions, and it's really um, sometimes these discussions go in one way or another way, but these have been really great questions and have really pushed the panel in a, in a really uh, interesting line of discussion. Um, before I pass over to Alex, I will leave you with a public service announcement from the other hat I wear, which is to study social media and politics, which is although WhatsApp is encrypted, you should know that anyone who is involved in a WhatsApp conversation group with you can download that entire conversation if they would like. WhatsApp can't read it, but the people who are in there can download all that data and it can be posted anywhere they would like to do it. So that's my public service announcement. <laughs> at the end here, I'm gonna pass it over to Alex just to wrap up and say thank you, but we'll hope to see you at more of our New York City Russia public policy <laughs> events and at more events at the Jordan Center. And we've got a full pack schedule this semester, so hope to see you at many more of them in the future. Thank you speakers for coming. Thank you audience. Thank you Jordan Center and everything that you do. You're just a wonderful partner. And please stay tuned. I think we're, we're both committed to keeping this New York partnership going and we'll try and keep finding interesting contemporary topics and bringing in various forms of expertise to try and help us make sense of it all. And by that standard, tonight was a great success. So thank you so much.